Well, good evening, Trinity family. I'm excited to be with you guys tonight. Um, tonight is going to be really special. Like the last song that we said, uh, just saying, um, is Lord come move. And I think that that's so impactful to the message that we're going to be um, hearing because this is like a, a moment for us to reflect back not only on ourself, but oftentimes the things that we're in relationship with and specifically our families. So uh, tonight we're going to be talking about Belong. That's the series that we've been in with our college ministry. And we're going to step into one of the actual topics that we t- we've taught on um, this past Tuesday. So the specifics of it is about over family and kind of what family is defined by when we look at scripture compared to that of our cultural time. So if you have your Bible, turn, to me, turn with me to Mark chapter 3. We're going to be in verse 31 all the way to verse 35. We're going to read this, and then we'll pray to continue. So, Mark 3. And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And the crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here, referring to those sitting around him and those who were following him that day, are my mother and my brothers. For those who do the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for another opportunity to sit down and to examine Scripture and to look into what you have called us to be ultimately as the church, but even deeper in that, how we are to act accordingly to a family. And so, Lord, I just pray right now, Holy Spirit, move through our hearts. Open the doors that we've shut, the relationships that we've closed off to, for us and, and, and the family members and friends. And ultimately, Lord, just move in our heart to reunite us with the love that you called us into and called us to be examples for and of. All these things we ask in your son's name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So like I said, we're in a series, Belong, in TCM, Trinity College Ministry. And so tonight is our kind of like young adults ministry. So if you aren't plugged in, we'd love to get you plugged in. Come talk with me after service. Uh, But we're walking through this series of Belong and specifically looking at what family meant according to Jesus. So if we were to look at this passage, we obviously see that Jesus is pushing for the idea of family or for the followers to relate to one another in the sense of a biological family. Um, So this idea doesn't stop with Jesus. What's what's Jesus' number one moniker, or like nickname, or name that he refers to God? That would be Father. And what he calls his apprentices or disciples is brothers and sisters. So this word, this term, brothers and sisters, is actually used all throughout the the New Testament. I think over 340 times the word adelphoi is actually used for the term of brothers and sisters as it's translated from Greek. So this idea of family is riddled all throughout the New Testament, and it's common to those who are following Jesus. You could also translate it um, as sibling, And this is by far the most used or dominant word used to describe the followers of Christ. So when we look at the people who are here tonight, when I look at you all, when we look around us, we see this term Adelphoi, or do we see this term, or should we see this term? So there's all types of communities within 2021, within the 21st century. And if we were to take a step back from Scripture and take a meta view over just society and culture we'd see different pockets of community. So if you were to start here in Lubbock, you might have a pocket or a community of a BFF, like your best friend. You might have uh, some friends that go to tech, or maybe you go to tech, or maybe you go to a community college. Those are forms of community. Maybe your grocery store is a form of community. You're like, hey, Costco is like a date for my wife and I. Like we always go there rather than HEB. I don't know what it is for you. But there's a meta view when you look at communities. There can be, it could be a state. When you're driving outside of Texas and you see a Texas license plate, you're like, that's my people. Or those are my, my, my people right there. Come on. So community can exist in different pockets and in different ways and in different topics, right? Such as school, grocery stores, and even in 2021, political parties. For Jesus, though, his idea of community, or at least his intent and his, his pursuit of community, was that of family. And that can kind of sound a little cliche within the church. You can be like, oh, community, of course, like family, like it's in the church, like, yes, let's do it. And it might sound sappy for you or like G-rated. 
It might be like, okay, I don't know, like I'm not too sure, I understand that. Well, this was probably one of the most radical ideas that Jesus had that ultimately led him to the cross. And uh, this is kind of like the idea that ultimately um, placed him in the position to be in front of Pilate and to be crucified because of his radical beliefs. So let me like just content dump on you. Let me just kind of share everything that I did in research and preparation for this so that way we can all be on the same page, not only here today, but also on the same page of what Jesus intended when he said this idea of a Delphoi or family. So up on the screen, I have two pictures for you. These are kind of the idea of a strong group and a weak group society. Strong group meaning not that it's better than the weak group, and not weak group meaning that it's weaker than the strong group, but it's more in the terms of a collectivist group and an individualistic group. So it might be small for you on the font size, but on the individualistic group, there's uniqueness, autonomy, uh, independence, self-sufficiency. Those are some of the traits that you see within an individualistic style culture or society. In terms of a collectivist culture, you have social rules that focus on promoting influence or selflessness, working as a group, dealing with what's best for society or the group at large, and there's oftentimes families or communities that have central roles. So to clear up the confusion, Jesus' role was that of a strong group culture. He was pushed into a strong group culture from the day that he was born, not much like we face in our kind of individualistic culture. So Bruce Molina, who's a cultural cultural anthropologist, did some research on this, and the working definition of a strong group society, the one that Jesus grew up in, is this. In a strong group society, the person perceives himself or herself to be a member of a group and responsible to the group for his or her actions, destiny, career, development, and life in general. The individual person is embedded in the group and is free to do what he or she feels is right and necessarily, here's the key word, only if in accord with the group's norm and only if in the action, if the action is in the group's best interest. The group has priority over the individual member. So some examples of this within society or within our world in the 21st century could be that of a Korean culture or that of a Japanese culture where it's very like premised or kind of promoted, uh, the, the idea of honor and shame are, is very promoted within the culture. Um, there's some uh, African cultures or even Arabic cultures that have a strong group society. And then basically if you are, have grown up within like a Hispanic family, like all Hispanic families that are like, hey, you gotta be home for Christmas, like Thanksgiving, 4th of July, all of it, that would be considered a strong group society or a strong group culture. So in the West, in America, we are what is considered a weak group society or a weak group culture or an individualistic culture. So the individual has priority, that you have kind of the, the preference or your opinion matters or your desire matters, and your autonomy is valued, self-determination, and ultimately happiness is valued more than the, the importance of the group or the group's identity. So an example of this in like film, I just, uh, I just got like upgraded and I have this like amazing like sound system. It's like a 5.1. It's not technically a 5.1 sound system, but it's close to it and it is amazing. So I, I'm so sorry if like my like outdoor neighbor like knows who I am and is like watching this. I'm so sorry. The subwoofer is too loud. Just let me know. Uh, but it is amazing. So I watched Avengers on it and it was incredible. So spoiler, I'm going to share some details. If you haven't seen Avengers, I'm sorry, it's already late in the game. You should have already watched it. So Infinity War is when all of the Avengers come back together after they've kind of split. There's kind of like some trust issues. And they're like, should we do this? Should we not do this? I don't know if I trust you. I'm going to kind of argue with you. So they get back together. Thanos is in the picture. Thanos is the enemy that is kind of trying to establish order or balance to the universe by killing off 50% of the population. Don't agree with his, his uh, logic or his methods or his ethics. But everybody comes back together, right, to fight Thanos. Thanos ultimately wins. He snaps his finger. Thanos, uh, like, goes into his, like, place of, like, solitude and confinement and, like, peace and tranquility. And everybody else is just left with despair. Then you enter into the end game, which is the, the last part of the series where um, everybody is like, hey, how, are we, how do we get everybody back? Ant-Man comes back, and then they go in the time machine, and then they go fight Thanos, and then Tony Stark, 
the most individualistic person, the most self-centered or like self-autonomy, opinionated, like his happiness over the group's happiness, this guy is the guy that saves the day. The most individualistic person. And I would argue that it's the most convincing part or the, the climax in, of the movie. The most moving part of the movie is when Tony Stark does the selfless act and, and, and ultimately killing himself so that way everybody else can live, counting the group more important than himself. So if we were to look at the characteristics of a strong group society or strong group culture, this might kind of sound weird to you or it might sound, sound kind of op- oppressive, honestly. There's clear roles. There's sometimes even gender roles. Um, there's inter-family roles between parents and children. And there's also the idea of honor or shame within the culture. Because in the West, we've kind of redefined the term freedom to be like, do whatever the heck you want. As long as it doesn't hurt me or harm me, pursue your happiness. And at the end of the day, I'll do the exact same which isn't the working definition of freedom within Christian theology or even Greek theology. So there's a bone to pick with that idea of freedom within our culture now and here. So we tend to judge like the strong group culture as oppressive. And you might even feel this within your life or in with, within somebody of your, of your friend. Uh, most of the times it's immigrant children who face the idea of having to choose between strong group ties with their culture and their family and the Western individualistic norms and cultural values. I think of the movie, like Big, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, uh, where she has to choose, hey, do I honor my family or do I choose what I want? Another one is The Big Sick. It's another TV show that deals with an immigrant child who faces this reality of choosing between a individualistic culture or a collectivist culture. So Jesus was a strong group culture. Strong group means there's roles, means that there's responsibilities, means that there's values to uphold, and that means that you have to submit yourself to the group, and that ultimately your family was of more importance than those of, that were around you. So family was patrilineal, and you don't have to hold on to that word. Patrilineal just means kind of like bloodline. But family was defined by the father's bloodline, not by marriage. So that's why when you read Matthew and you're like super bored, because at the beginning of it, it's like, so-and-so, son of so-and-so, son of so-and-so, and and son of so-and-so. And And you're like, do I have to read this whole thing? That is why there are no surnames in the Bible, because it was patrilineal, meaning that it was associated with the father's bloodline. It's kind of interesting that nowadays we have this idea, but Iceland, we've adopted this way of doing names. Iceland is an example that doesn't have surnames. So they still go by like son or so-and-so, son of so-and-so. So it'd be like Carl, or Jonathan, son of Carl, or Carl, son of Carl as well. Kind of plays into your ego, I guess. I don't know. Um, But here's why this matters, and here's why this is important. Technically, your spouse was not a part of your family. Yes, there was still romance within the relationships. There was still affection and, and love and all those things. But technically, your closest relationship was that of your siblings and that of your family. This scripture that we read was for a different time and a different culture group, but it transcends into our day and age. And if we do not understand the culture that Jesus was brought up in, we can totally miss the intent of his words and the idea of family. So in the West, it's totally different than Jesus' times. And I'm not advocating that we go back to no surnames or we go back to arranged marriages or anything like that. But I want you to understand that a strong group culture you would assume that your brother and your sister would be your closest bond until death, and then your wife. And in the West, it's the opposite. That's why you go celebrate your holidays with your wife's family. So we have this difference within Scripture and within the church, right? Right now, it's just different. Another example of this is Buzz Lightyear. Um, I'm a huge Toy Story fan. Like, I grew up on Toy Story. Like, I absolutely loved it. We had, like, Woody and Buzz Lightyear. But Buzz Lightyear, at one point has to face his, face his uh, arch enemy or his nemesis, which ultimately becomes his father as he realizes, right? And he has this choice. He says, do I have to choose? And they're like, yeah, we got to choose, right? He has to choose if he's going to follow after his bloodline father or his family. Not his family by bloodline, but his family. And it's the same for us. What does Jesus call his apprentices? Adelphoi, brothers and sisters, He calls them blood. And a first century Jewish 
village, tribe, that is radical. To associate this level of intimacy with strangers and call them to walk in that was a radical idea. Like, you do not get away with this. So if we turn to the first page of, like, Scripture and we're reading in Genesis, we see Jesus, or God, um, say, let us make mankind in our image. So if you were to say, let us make mankind in our image, us and our, you see this idea that God already exists in a web of relationship. God is a person of family who creates people for family. And I love this uh, author, he says it this way, he says, God is love, and love cannot exist without relationship. So we're created out of Genesis. If we're going to the first page, not going to movie references or anything, the first page says that you were created out of an out, outflow of relationship, out of a generous, loving soul, and created to do likewise. The idea that I want you to picture is that of a rock and a stream, that as people come into your life, you are to be like a, a, a current mover, a current maker, that you orientate people back into the idea of rest, and life and forgiveness in the family of God. Again, this doesn't extend into bloodline, but this extends into the people that are sitting to the right of you, to the left of you, people that work on staff, people that don't work on staff, people that are in your neighborhood, and ultimately everybody who is a brother and a sister of Christ. So the two radical thoughts that Jesus left, with, left us with as we unpack this are first off, that we are not defined by patrilineal bloodline, but by whoever does the, God, the will of the Father or the will of God. So Jesus' culture was far more ethnocentric. You could argue that as we've diversified ethnically, we've also diversified ethically. And I, I kind of like cringe at the idea that even as we enter into 2021 and 2022, everything political and everything racially, like, like racial tension that was of the year past has kind of like subsided and it was really just used as a political weapon because those issues still exist. So when you see Jesus in an ethnocentric, multi-diverse place calling everybody of different groups to act as a family in a radical way, not just Gentiles, not just Jews, not just Samaritans, not just whites, not just Caucasians, not just Hispanics, not just African Americans, all kinds of people, as in Matthew 5, Jesus' family was made up of sinners. Jesus' family was made up of outcasts, of people of different color and of different backgrounds, of different beliefs, of different tribes. It was a multi-ethnic, multi-ethnocentric group coming together to glorify the Father. Let's turn to Matthew 5 and look at verses 29 through 32. Matthew wanted to throw a banquet to honor Jesus. So he invited Jesus to his home for dinner and along with many other tax collectors and other notable sinners. While they were all sitting together at the table, the Jewish religious leaders and experts of the law complained to Jesus' disciples. Why would you defile yourself by eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? Doesn't Jesus know that it's wrong to do that? And then, of course, Jesus is like all-knowing. I don't know if he like legit like heard this or if like he knew that they said it, but it says... Uh, Jesus overheard their complaining and said, Who goes to the doctor for a cure? Those who are well or those who are sick? I've not come to call the righteous, but to call those who fail to measure up to repentance. So ultimately, Jesus is hanging out pe with people who are uh, on the outcasts, on the fringes of society, the guys who act more feminine, or the girls who act more masculine, or the people that are considered lesser in our day and age. And eventually, this is what the idea brought Jesus to. It brought him to the cleansing of the temple, where he goes and walks into the temple, and he says that you, you have made my house of prayer into a den of thieves. And he sternly calls them out. In the language of Jeremiah, or the words of Jeremiah, he's like, you've lost the plot. You, you, you don't hold on to the truth, and you don't know what the truth is. You guys have turned this into a store goods, into a Costco where there's free samples for you, and you're walking into a place where there is, there's spiritual doctrine, but there's no love, where there's, there's discipline, but there's no love. This idea that there's, there's a church or there's a gathering, but there's not a family. It's a den of thieves and not a house of prayer. So you don't say these things and get away with them in a first century strong group culture. This is ultimately what got Jesus killed. You read in, in Scripture where people were literally stoned to death 
This is not your typical, you know, Wall Street, New York trip where you see in the back alley like somebody being stoned to death. Like this is a strong group culture where you do not say those things and get away with it. The second radical idea that he left with us was that you place your second family, or in the terms of Buzz Lightyear, you place your, your family, not your bloodline family, you place your second family above your patrilineal family. So that of a weak group, there's kind of low family ties, there's widespread divorce, there's low responsibility, and this isn't to say that if you're not doing the dishes or taking out the trash or have like anything like that, that you're a weak group culture within your family, but this is what you see in a meta view of America or the West or the European West. So if we were to look back at Bruce Molina's quote at the beginning of this and exchange the word group with church, I wonder if it would kind of ring true with our life or if it doesn't. So let's read it. In a church, the person perceives him or herself to be a member of the church and responsible to the church for his actions or his or her actions, destiny, career, development, and life in general. The individual person is embedded in the church and is free to do what he or she feels is right or necessarily only if in accord with the church's norms and only if the action is in the church's best interest. The church has priority over the individual member. Is this how we kind of see our church or our life, or is this kind of not line up? Maybe if we've been a, if kind of like colonized by the Western hyper-individualistic culture, it would read more like this. The individual person is embedded in their self and is free to do what he or she feels is right or necessarily only if in accord with their norms and only if the action is in their best interests. The individual has priority over the group. So this isn't to like, this is not to like guilt trip you or like, you know, like cash shame on you guys. You're like, you guys are doing it wrong. Like, no, that's not what I'm saying. But this idea of family, you, you sit around a table and sometimes somebody makes a mess, right? And you get to clean it up. Everybody gets to clean it up. There's that kind of like shock and all like, oh, I can't believe you spilled the tea at Carino's. Like, oh my goodness, like, ah, right? But we address it, we clean it up, and we move on. So this idea isn't to provide like shame or guilt or like condemnation that you guys are doing it wrong. I'm not saying that you are. I'm not saying that you're doing it right. I'm here to address the idea of family and what it's supposed to look like in the 21st century now with us, this idea of family. So if, if we're, we're being honest, this is really ultimately a call to be together, like in Acts 2, don't forsake being together. Like if you look at Acts 2, verse 44 through 47, like you'll see how many times like being together or not forgetting to like hang out basically is mentioned within that verse. It's a ton of times which means that we're not supposed to forget about it if it's mentioned a lot of times. If you look at Galatians 4, you see this idea of adoption within the idea of the faith, how we've been from adoption to sonship. And if you know anything about adoption, when the judge hits the gavel to the wood, at that point, that child is now part of that family in a 360-degree view. It's not like they choose if they want to have one parent, and then the next week they want to have two parents. Or like, hey, I don't really know if I want to have a sibling. I'm not really used to that. Like, I'll get onto it later, maybe. No, it's like, you have a family. You have a mother. You have a brother. You have a sister. You have cousins. You have a family. And it's the same thing with us in the church, that we have a Delphoi. We have brothers and sisters that we count as blood or relatives or family. And that is what Jesus is calling us to do. He's calling us to operate like a strong group culture, to count the group or the church priority over our own individualistic culture. So Jesus' vision, ultimately, was simply that of a family. It, like, it wasn't a Tuesday night college meeting. It's not a Wednesday night midweek service. Like This isn't church. This is an idea of ter- church, of teaching the scriptures. But this isn't the end goal. This isn't the end for us. It extends further into our life, into relationships. So I want to do a little bit of an exercise. We're going to kind of run through this a little bit quick. So bear with me. But if you want to, take out your phone or take out a piece of paper. And this isn't going to be on the screen, so don't worry. Um, We're going to walk through some basic forms of healthy family. These are eight signs of healthy family. And I want you to kind of rate yourself within it. This is just like an assessment to understand if you're operating out of a healthy family. Maybe, like, I understand that you don't have healthy family ties. 
but you still, again, have a family here. So grade yourself however you wish, but grade yourself. So the basic forms of a healthy family, number one, is that a healthy family eats together. On a score from one to 10, how often do you do this? The philosopher Albert Borgman, um, who's like an expert on TV and like the disintegration of society because of TVs and because of like people isolating themselves, he wrote and he said, yes, fornication is bad. Yes, adultery is bad, but not sitting down for dinner is deadly. So number one, healthy families eat together. Number two, you spend time with each other. Number three, you hold each other accountable. And this can be in discipline or intervention. I mean, this is seen within scripture. Uh, Excommunication is a thing within scripture. Some other forms of it could be unwillingness to forgive, false doctrine. I think even laziness or the the lack of bearing your responsibility is corrected within scripture. Um, Jesus had a way of doing this in loving acceptance, but also loving accountability. So within a family, do you hold each other accountable? Number four, you share resources and responsibility. You do the dishes, they mow the lawn, they take out the trash, you sweep the house. How do you do responsibility and resources. How do you share in those? Number five, you bear one another's burdens. You listen to each other. Maybe you change the tire for a friend. Maybe you help them move. You bear one another's burdens. Number six, you make decisions together. You don't just move off and say, hey, you guys should visit me. I'll catch you guys in a year. You talk through big decisions. You make sure whatever financial investment that you're about to step into, you've consulted with different people within the family or within your friend group because that's what a family does. Number seven, you release and encourage. This can be like the person that hypes you up and they're like, yeah, you look so good today. And you're like, I didn't even do my hair. Thank you. (laughs) Number eight, you're faithful until death. When's the last time you like walked into church and like your friend that you always sit next to, you're like, man, I'm going to move wherever you move because we're faithful until death. Like that doesn't happen anymore, right? That doesn't happen. But in a family, that does happen. It's not that you upset me and I'm going to go to the next relationship because of what you did to me. And ultimately, I'm just going to repeat the toxic trait of leaving and, and just kind of dealing it with all my own. In a family, you deal with it together. So can it be said of you, can it be said of me, that I'm a healthy person in a healthy family, or where do I score within that? And maybe you're like, Jonathan, I did not score well, and I don't want to score well on that. I don't think that my idea of church is to that extent. Let me just share with you, that is not Jesus' idea. That is not Scripture's idea. We do not get that idea from anywhere but culture. And ultimately, this is because of of the Western hyper-individualistic culture that we find ourselves in. There's this idea that we've entered from a pre-Christian culture into a Christianized culture, then into a post-modern Christian culture. And if we're not careful, we can be be colonized into a post-modern Christian culture and adopt the norms and the values and those things from that culture. So, are we living from feeling? Are we living from culture? Or are we living from scripture? And are we living in the church? That's my question. So, Um, As we kind of speed through this, uh, family is the place of our deepest hurt, but it's also the place of our deepest healing. Our highest highs and our lowest lows, the memories that we have of hurt and the memories that we have of the most fun times ultimately come from relationships. We're both created for relationships and also hurt by relationships. I'm reminded of this idea that weeds and vegetables grow in the same garden if we don't tend it. There's like this movie quote by Denzel Washington in Equalizer, And he's like talking to this guy and he's like, there's two kinds of pain. There's a pain that hurts and a pain that alters. And I love that quote. Shout out to Pastor Stacy who introduced it to me. But this idea of pain that alters is only because we look into pain. So what does loneliness tell us about ourselves? What does that pain of loneliness say about our life? Loneliness is ultimately a proof of a relationship or relational design. At the core of who we are, we are designed for family and designed out of a family. That there's a longing to participate in life with others. 
We can't escape it. Like there's, there's this deep inner ache that if we are alone, that we're doing something wrong. And my friend, I would argue it's because we are designed for it. We are both designed for it and defined by our relationships. Neuroscientists actually tell us, before you come out of the womb, your brain is developing to recognize people's voices. Before you come out of the womb, you are designed to relate to people, to trust them. And the, the idea of a garden is that you have weeds and vegetables at the same time, but there's an idea of a foundation of soil. And the soil of our life is trust. It's trusting others to be able to grow. And if we don't have that trust, ultimately for ourselves, it'll bleed into the relationships of those around us. And if we're not careful, it'll bleed into the church and into our relationship with God. Relationship is important. And if you get into it, it's even more crazy because you, you realize that the thing that actually hurt me is the thing that will actually heal me. The idea of stepping into relationship, stepping into this idea of being vulnerable with somebody that I don't know and treating them like a brother or sister, and then you being responsible and knowing that they are trusting me with what they're telling me. How am I going to respond to that? Am I going to respond as a stranger or am I going to respond as a sibling? So there's this idea that home is the place, like if you have to go back to home for like Thanksgiving, then they have to take you back, right? That's how it kind of works, right? And it's the same thing with a church. That if we're to operate as a family, we accept. We accept not as we want them to be, but as they are. Not because that's the end point or that's the place that they stay, but ultimately that's the place of starting to grow in relationship. So in family, there's ultimately a bond that is deeper than culture. There's, there's a bond that, that extends past like the clothing brand that you wear, whether you're like shopping at, at Champs or Walmart, whether you're a worker at Chipotle or you're a real estate agent, whether you're a 2021 Mercedes owner or a handed down Buick, whether you're a three-job mom or a single parent, a father who is struggling, whatever it is, we, whoever you are, we are all in one, the same family, because we're doing the will of God. We're all one family. So in community, you're oftentimes exposed. Like if you chew with your mouth open or if you sleep with your mouth open, like they're going to take a picture of you, you know, and like you're napping after like Thanksgiving. We've got to get past the fall festival. That's the 31st. But once we get to Thanksgiving, like you have like all your family in there and exposing you, right? But through that exposure, you begin to know what is acceptable and good. Acceptable and good. So as we close, I want to leave you with one quote. This is Christopher Smith and John Pattison who wrote Slow Church, the book Slow Church. They said, spiritual formation occurs primarily in the context of community. Long-term interpersonal relationships are the crucible of genuine progress in the Christian life. People who stay grow. People who, do, who leave do not grow. It is, it is a simple, profound biblical reality that we both grow and thrive together or we do not, much, we do not grow much at all. So, people who stay grow, people who don't, don't grow. It's that simple. And I'm reminded of like the best memories that I have from like, you know, high school trips or like forced camps that my parents like set me on and they're like, you have to go to this. And I'm like, why? The best memories came from those things. Why? Because quality time comes from quantity time. Quality time comes from quantity time. The more you're in relationship with your family, the more trust you establish, and the more trust you establish with them, the more you grow. Because the more you know about them, and the more that you obey them, the more that you trust them. And it's the same with us. It's the same with us and their Heavenly Father. The more that we know Him, the more that we are able to obey Him, and the more that we obey Him, we know His character and we can trust Him even more. And this cycle just keeps on repeating for a love of God. So this isn't to challenge you or convict you, but just to encourage you or, or to provide a, like a thought in your life. Do I see my church as a family or do I see my church as a, a service to attend? Do I see the people that are to the left and to the right of me 
as maybe a regular attender, maybe a person who hands out, you know, the communion cups on Sunday, or do I see that person as my brother and sister? How do I view them? Is this a family or is this just an event that I, t- uh, that I attend? So we're going to enter into another time of worship, and I want you just to reflect on it. There's this idea that worship extends just past music, and there's this idea of worship through introspection, that as you begin to quiet the external noise or you begin to quiet your spirit, the Lord will speak into your life. And I encourage you to enter into that introspection, to enter into this time of worship, and to see how the Lord can call you deeper into relationship and ultimately deeper into relationship with those around you. Let's worship.